Thank you so much for inviting me to talk with you today. My name is Robbie LaFleur, and I live in beautiful Minneapolis, Minnesota. I grew up on a farm in Northwest Minnesota in a very Norwegian American township. I learned Norwegian at the University of Minnesota and afterwards studied weaving at a traditional handcraft school in Fagernes, Norway. That's in the Valdres region in central Norway. I had a long career as the director of the library for the Minnesota legislature. Now I weave, write, and also publish the Norwegian textile letter, which is published online. I am a super fan of the Norwegian artist Frida Hansen, whose career spanned the last decade of the 1900s through her death in 1931. My lecture will reveal my deep admiration for her style, her talent, and for her success as an entrepreneur at the beginning of the 20th century. I'm particularly interested in a technique she developed for open warp wool transparency. I had a fellowship from the American Scandinavian Foundation in 2019 to travel to Stavanger, Norway, to investigate her transparent tapestries. I'll tell you about Frida Hansen's career and show you lots of photos. I also enjoy pulling in American stories of connections to her work. But we'll set the stage with a bit of her eventful and ultimately challenging early life. This is a photo of Frida Hansen that shows up frequently. But this is one that I like much better. I found it on the Norwegian Digital Library. I think it shows her seriousness, her determination and resolve even as a young woman. In 1855, Frida Hansen was born Frederica Boletta Pettersen in Stavanger, Norway, the daughter of Petter Pettersen, one of the wealthiest businessmen in town. She led a sheltered and privileged life at Hillevog, an estate outside Stavanger. She showed an early interest in art, she wanted to be a painter, and had private lessons from local prominent artists, including Kitty Schelland. She married another one of the wealthiest businessmen in Stavanger, Wilhelm Severin Hansen, in 1873. She was only 18. Her father died soon after, and Frida and Wilhelm moved back to Hillevog. Her artistic ambitions were set aside. As a young wife, Frida Hansen threw herself into planting extensive gardens with roses and peonies and exotic flowers and birds, motifs she would weave her whole life. Turkeys, guinea fowl, and peacocks roamed the gardens, and turtles and fish filled aquariums. People from Stavanger would come out to visit the elaborate gardens. Friedem and Wilhelm had three children. Tragically, two would die. But then her life of ease and privilege ended 10 years after her marriage. Her husband's business went bankrupt during a nationwide economic downturn, and they were forced to sell Hillebog. Her husband went abroad to earn money in the mining industry. Frida moved into an apartment in Stavanger with her mother and sister. But she was entrepreneurial and soon began an embroidery business, which would have been acceptable for a woman of her high social standing. This is in the 1880s. This photo shows some of the gardens behind the original Hillevog house. But now the weaving story begins. Frida Hansen was familiar with historical Norwegian weaving. She'd traveled around the countryside with her brother-in-law and admired old pieces. One day, as she described many years later, a person came to her embroidery shop and asked whether Frida could repair an old weaving. Perhaps it was one like this? Frida wrote later, suddenly I remembered my brother-in-law's words. You should weave like that. It went like fire through me. That's what I wanted to do. I would take up the old Norwegian weaving, renew it, make it available, and also make it a means of employment. And so began my life's work, which has fulfilled my mind, my artistic desires, and my life. But Frida still needed to learn how to weave, and took some time for her to find anyone still weaving in the old techniques. She heard of a teacher up in Song, Shirstina Hauglum, and arranged to visit her in 1889. She described her experience in a letter a few years later. On my arrival in Lairdal, I was immediately convinced from my previous study that I was standing in front of the old work in all its authenticity. One look at the old method was therefore enough, and once I obtained a loom and learned how to set it up, I traveled home happy over the rich exchange. 
This is one of Frida Hansen's looms based on that model, now at Frida Hansen's Hoos or Frida Hansen's house in Stavanger. The house is a beautiful white building on the hill above Hillebog, the house where Frida Hansen lived. It used to be the home of Frida's mother-in-law. It's now a gallery and meeting place, and there's an apartment on the upper floor that's used for artist residencies. This is Frida Hansen's other loom sitting at Frida Hansen's who's a narrower one. In 2017, her great granddaughter, Lisa Levy, who is also a tapestry weaver, set up a new piece using an old pattern from the Frida Hansen archive. On the left, this sideways shot shows how the warp threads pass over the top beam on the tapestry loom and use weights for tension. Now, Frida Hansen was a very confident person. When she obtained her loom and wove her first tapestry, her first tapestry, she chose to make it over two meters high. Within a year of getting that loom, she not only wove the huge tapestry, but also investigated the natural dyes she wanted to use for her yarn. The image was based on a small painting by Knut Bergslian, Birkebeiner soldiers smuggling Hokan Hokansen over the mountain. Her technical skills were not fully developed, and she used embroidery afterwards for some of the facial features. Also, and this amazed me, it was actually folded and sewn on the backside to hide where it was uneven. Despite these problems, it was well received when it was exhibited, but also criticized for its technique. Henrik Grosch, the head of the Arts and Crafts Museum wrote, however, her skills are insufficient when it concerns the depictions of figures. With all respect for her diligence and proficiency, it can't be described as anything but a blunder. Oh my gosh, I would cry. When she was interviewed later in her life, Frida described the piece just as a test piece. At the time, she took the criticism to heart, and in an exhibit in Sheehan the following year, she, dis she displayed strictly ornamental weavings inspired by old Norwegian coverlets. But this weaving taught Frida Hansen that she should not strive for completely realistic images but create designs that were more suited to the medium of weaving. So during the 1890s, Frida Hansen worked to rediscover old Norwegian weaving techniques and to build a thriving weaving industry to support herself and others. She was deeply interested in the qualities of Norwegian wool and in medieval Norwegian tapestry techniques. This was during an era of national romanticism when strong patriotic feelings led to the search for authentic historical folk art. Frida Hansen moved from Stavanger to Christiania, now Oslo, in 1892 and started a weaving school and a dye business to produce yarn with natural dyes. Here is an early weaving in which she combined the traditional geometric patterns that you might find in an old coverlet with more naturalistic ducks flying along the top. When the Norwegian Handcraft Association decided to exhibit Norwegian women's work in the Women's Building at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, ex, Exhibition in Chicago, Frida Hansen was chosen to design and weave the tapestries. Most were in traditional Norwegian geometric designs but mermaids and swans shown here and the wild flying ducks from the previous slide were exceptions. In these tapestries, Hansen added naturalistic elements in a way that built on, but yet moved beyond traditional Norwegian weaving. Hansen wasn't trying to imitate a painting in her weaving. She was creating her own form with stylized motifs that were suited to the medium of weaving. This tapestry was sold to a Californian, according to a newspaper account in the Norwegian Biographical Encyclopedia, but no one knows where it is now. So please find it and, and tell me. Frida Hansen had another tapestry at the Chicago World's Fair, Dandelion, commissioned by the Norwegian Suffragist Association for the Women's Building. She came up with a complex design with the theme of growth, showing a strong woman at the core. The processions of figures on either side and below the figure carry dandelions in various life stages. Dandelions are the plants that grow the more they are trod upon, so they're a symbol of resistance. The tapestry is big, about seven feet square. It was just acquired by the, by the Stavanger Art Museum in 2020. 
here's a detail, and you can see these small figures marching with the dandelions. Moving through Frida Hansen's early career, this tapestry from 1894 had slightly more naturalistic figures. Olaf Liljekrantz, too. Here's a detail of Olaf Liljekrantz. You can see that the faces are becoming a bit more realistic, but there are still areas that resemble traditional coverlet designs up here. Doesn't this part look like an old Norwegian weaving? In 1895, Frida Hansen took a study trip to Paris and Cologne. In particular, she wanted to improve her drawing skills in her quest to find the most suitable figurative style for tapestry. She was inspired by the International Art Nouveau movement, and the birds and flowers in the exotic gardens of her youth fit right into this style. So while she was completely dedicated to renewing old Norwegian weaving traditions and techniques, she also began to follow her own path as an artist. Mermaids Who Light the Moon definitely has an Art Nouveau feeling. And here's a detail. You can see the mermaid lighting the moon. Through the 1890s, her designs changed radically. While she continued to design decorative works inspired by old Norwegian designs, she also created artworks with new international influences. As the images in her work moved away from Norwegian folktales and mythology, her works were sometimes criticized as being not quite Norwegian enough, or her colors were too feminine. When you look at this tapestry of Pharaoh's daughter, you can imagine that those bare-breasted girls definitely didn't look Norwegian. Perhaps her most famous tapestry is Melkevayen from 1898, or the Milky Way. It was purchased by the Decorative Arts Museum in Hamburg. The Hebrew lettering across the bottom is a verse from Genesis chapter 1, verse 15. Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. This is a tapestry that you can admire with the photograph, but you can't truly appreciate it until you can see the weaving and the technique in person. At the end of the 1890s, Frida Hansen developed and patented her signature wool transparent technique, and the first pieces were exhibited in Bergen in 1898. In her transparencies, she used wool, warp, and weft, and left portions unwoven. When you view the curtains in full light, as you see on the right, the colors and patterns dominate. If the curtain is backlit, you can see this on the right, the shining spaces of the open warps complete, create a completely different effect. The technique is well suited to use as portieres or curtains. When used as a door drapery to separate rooms, they became colorful and light-filled doors. When closed and viewed as a flat panel, the designs can be fully appreciated. The open warps and softness of the wool warp and weft add drape and they're easily moved apart. Since most of you are familiar with weaving, I want to spend a minute reviewing Frida Hansen's two main types of technique, just to dispel any confusion. Frida Hansen was a noted Norwegian tapestry weaver and her most significant art pieces, about 30 in all, were woven in regular tapestry, as you see on the left, in the tradition of continental gobelan tapestry and Norwegian billetvev, or picture weaving. All the warp is completely covered. Frida Hansen considered her large, fully warp-covered tapestries to be her primary, primary artistic work, and only one copy was made of each design. She wove them herself, although I'm sure she had help. She also developed her transparency technique shown on the right, in which a portion of the warp threads are left unwoven. In the photo of the blue roses, you can see the blue open warps. Several copies of her transparencies tended to be woven in varying sizes. Frida Hansen designed her transparencies, but they were woven in her workshop by other weavers. 
Frida Hansen's tapestries and her transparent weavings had their biggest international breakthrough at the World Exhibition in Paris in 1900. The important Norwegian critic Henrik Roche, remember he criticized her previous one, wrote approvingly about Frida Hansen's work with transparencies, but still felt that many of the patterns were a little too Japanese. On the other hand, he thought that margariter, or daisies, had much more in common with the old Norwegian tapestry patterns because of the rows of flowers. The Paris World's Fair was a complete success for Frida Hansen. She wrote home to a friend that it was successful beyond her wildest dreams. At the fair, the French critics were not impressed with the tapestries from their own country. There was nothing new about them. They liked the Scandinavian exhibits, particularly the Norwegian, and felt they were fresh, not merely copies of paintings. The Paris World Exhibition led to many orders from museums around Europe for Frida Hansen's transparencies, but not from museums in Norway. Happily, there is an example of daisies in the National Museum in Oslo now. The museum just reopened in 2022, and the transparency is displayed between two panes of glass, which highlight the unwoven sections. I have a personal story about this transparency. I had seen photos of the daisy's transparency, including this one, but I really didn't get it. Like, this made such a fuss at a World's Fair? It didn't seem that interesting, especially compared to other transparencies I had seen. Then I saw this photo a while back, a historical photo showing the panels used as curtains in a villa in Bergen. You can see how gorgeous they would look with light streaming in through the windows. And then I saw the panel for myself at the National Museum last month. Oh, that's why they're such a big deal. The weaving is exquisite and the texture is so captivating and beautiful. These detail shots show the edges and the bottom. Her designs were purchased by applied arts museums throughout Europe. Emil Hanover from the Danish Arts and Crafts Museum purchased a transparency called Hesteblomster or dandelions, and he wrote, the immediate impression with this tapestry is the sun of a summer day over a flower-filled meadow. You can't find a lovelier weaving in the whole exhibit. You might remember that many of Frida Hansen's transparency designs were woven multiple times. Ever since I began my research, I've had many people contact me when they see pieces in the transparency technique. This is a detail from a copy of Dandelions in the United States at the Edith Macy Conference Center in New York. It was a gift to the American Girl Scouts at the Fourth International Convention of Girl Scouts at Camp Edith Macy in 1926. In this detail, you can see the heads of the dandelions and the jagged leaves and hopefully where the open warps would be in between. And just for a little aside and a little context, the turn of the 20th century was at a time when artists were looking back to folk culture for uniquely Norwegian motifs and themes. Gerhard Munte was the most famous designer of tapestry cartoons, and he drew heavily on folk tales and Norse mythology. His work is amazing and deserving of a whole other talk. Many artists during that time felt that works were only successful to the extent that they promoted this new nationalistic feeling. So you can see that Frida Hansen wasn't quite fitting into the most popular mold. Frida Hansen's great success at the Paris World's Fair drew international attention to her work, including the United States. In 1901, Frederick Sandberg gave a series of lectures on Art Nouveau in Decorative Arts at the Art Institute of Chicago. In tapestry, he felt that Norway was the preeminent country and praised Frida Hansen both for her work in reviving tapestry in Norway and for her artistry. Frida Hansen was at the top of her career on many fronts during the first decade of the 20th century. From 1897 to 1906, she ran a tapestry workshop and designed many transparencies. At one time, her workshop had over 30 weavers. 
Her international reputation soared. From 1900 to 1909, she created at least one monumental tapestry each year. The Dance of Salome was woven in 1900, and it was purchased by the Decorative Arts Museum in Zurich. It's seven and a half feet high and over 22 feet long. I really need to get to Zurich to take some more photos. I took these two in 2015 when it was exhibited in Stavanger. Look how beautiful this transparent veil is woven in the photo to the left. Frida Hansen was an important figure in the resurgence of interest in historical Norwegian tapestry. The old tapestries were an important source of information, but she was captivated by a panoply of other international influences. She took her study tour to Paris and Cologne in 1895, when Art Nouveau design was prominent. Asian and Japanese artworks were popular and shown in Scandinavia. Hansen was familiar with international publications, such as the British magazine, The Studio, with articles on William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. So, but this shows that she did choose the same themes for her tapestries as some in the historical Norwegian tapestries with a quite different and modern effect. Here is a historical ver Norwegian version of the Feast of Herod from between 1650 and 1750. And here's Salome with the head of John the Baptist. And here's Salome in Frida Hansen's tapestry. She looks a lot slinkier in 1900. Still, I think that Frida Hansen's tapestries resemble many medieval Norwegian tapestries in her use of pattern everywhere, in the background and in the richly decorated clothing of the figures. And there's an American Frida Hansen story to tell, a recent mystery that was solved after 90 years. Berta Oscar Berg was a weaving teacher and socialite in Brooklyn. She grew up in Stavanger and had been a pupil of Frida Hansen. How she came to write to own three Frida Hansen weavings was written in very flowery, lang flowery language in House Beautiful magazine in 1929. As the story went, she was telling a group of American art connoisseurs in New York City that Norway had a highly developed art of weaving and it predated many other European countries. The article said her audience was skeptical, so she sailed to Norway the very next week to get proof of her statements. Berta Oscar Berg bought Southward from Frida Hansen in 1903, and Americans were impressed. Southward was shown many times in the United States between 1907 and 1931. It was included at a tapestry exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum where most of the 42 items were for sale and most cost in the hundreds of dollars. One was 10,000, another 15,000, and then there was Southward for 50,000. For 90 years, the tapestry was missing until Peter Papp, a noted rug dealer, opened a plastic container found in the estate of his friend and unfolded the tapestry, dusty, but still in perfect condition. I wrote at length about Southward when it was reintroduced to the world in glorious color. You can read several articles about Frida Hansen, about the cleaning of the tapestry, and about all the times that Southward was exhibited in New York in the early 1900s on the Norwegian Textile Letter website. You can even watch a webinar talk about the mystery on the Westerheim YouTube channel. Each article I found about the exhibitions was filled with glowing statements. The figures were described several ways in newspaper accounts as maidens, red-haired nymphs, goddesses, clean-limbed goddesses, girls, golden-haired daughters of the sun, and buxom and blonde Norse maids. This is a pretty swan from the tapestry. I'll mention some other notable works from the coming years, but certainly not all of them. E. Rosenhaven or In the Rose Garden, was woven in 1904, and it shows eight women wandering in a garden, wandering in nature, a dream of a golden age. It may have been influenced by the work of Gustav Klimt. Roses were so popular with Frida Hansen. Here is a detail of a figure from In the Rose Garden, 
alongside a set of tapestry panels from 1903. Rita's Flowers. Semper Videntes is a centerpiece of the Frida Hansen Room at the Stavanger Art Museum. Four women each carry a symbolic item. A money bag represents riches, a pearl necklace for vanity, a candle for eternal love, and violets for beauty and art. Frida Hansen's biographer, Anna Kintua, suggested that the lowest placed figures represent money and vanity, earthly concerns. The higher figures stride toward true love and art. Flowers were Frida Hansen's passion and inspiration, so it makes sense that they represent art in the hands of the upper figure. Perhaps this was a self-portrait? Along the borders, flames of eternal light are entwined with the roses of love. Here are a couple of the beautiful skirt patterns because weavers especially like to see details. The Stavanger Art Museum also owns the watercolor cartoon for Semper Vedentes. I want to emphasize two things about Frida Hansen. The first is that she was incredibly talented as a designer and artist. Also, she may have been the first European tapestry weaver to both design and weave her tapestries. This was unusual at the time when tapestries were designed by artists and woven in workshops by weavers. I mentioned that Hansen received press in the United States. This is a quote from all, from all places, the Minneapolis Journal in 1904. There is one feature about her work worthy of special notice. She isn't merely the performer of the mechanical work, but the idea for the motifs also originate with her. She makes her own drawings after which the cloth is woven. In other words, she has the same relationship to her work as the original painter has to his picture. And the second point is that she must have had boundless energy to be so entrepreneurial. At the same time, at the, right in the first years of 1900s, at the same time she was designing and weaving monumental tapestries, she was also running a tapestry studio. It ran from 1897 to 1906 and produced a wide variety of household textiles made to order, including rugs, upholstery, and curtains. At one point, it was the largest tapestry studio in Europe, employing around 30 weavers. Yefta's daughter was woven in 1913. One of the reasons I include it here is because the Norwegian Digital Library included an image of both the front and back. You can see that the back is much more vibrant than the front. Here's the back, here's the hanging device. Frida Hansen wove her tapestries in the traditional Norwegian billedvev tradition with the threads woven in so that the back is as beautiful as the front. So I think they could just switch that hanging band to the back and display the better side. So now we're talking about a transparency again. Over the years, some of Frida Hansen's transparency designs changed from decorative and repetitive patterns for utilitarian textiles to more developed single artistic images like this transparency from 1914, Summer Night's Dream. There are trees and rose bushes and swans on the beautiful summer night. Havfruer, or mermaids, is a transparency at the Stavanger Art Museum. This is what Frida Hansen wrote about the mermaids. I have imagined that mermaids down in the depths long to ascend and want to rise into the light. One of them is already at the surface and reaches toward the sun but she is held down by the two more earthbound mermaids and never frees herself from the mire. Here are some details. In the first, you see that the transparencies at the Stavanger Art Museum and other places are hung away from the wall so that you can glimpse the beautiful shadows they cast. In the middle detail, the mermaids under the sea are stretching towards the outside world. Um, but doesn't that underwater world look more colorful and appealing? The third photo shows how the mermaid scales are woven with little fan shapes. 
separated by a bit of open warp. Another version of the mermaid transparency hangs in the public library in Stavanger. It was woven by a student of Frida Hansen, Mimi Bull, in 1916. The central image is the same, but in this one, the border, uh, the border is different. She used a thin metallic thread for part of the weft. As a weaver, it was instructive to examine her technique so closely. I brought a tape measure so I could figure out exactly how many ends per inch she used in her warp. It was interesting in all the transparencies I observed that she used varying thicknesses of yarn in the weft. In this piece, I could see that the thinner beige yarn requires 19 passes, while the thicker blue weft required 12 for the same length. Also, sometimes she used singles yarn and other times she used plied yarn. When there's more than one example of her transparency designs to see, it's interesting to note the different color choices that were made by the weaver. Surteruser, or Black Roses, is owned by the Nordiska Museum in Stockholm. Frida Hansen used many different colors for the warp in her open work transparencies, but blue is the most popular. This is a very dramatic blue. High Summer hangs at the Stavanger Art Museum. It's impressive when seen at a distance, but a bit difficult to discern the whole image. It's a stand of some sort at the bottom, and then a vase, and then a fruit, and then roses and birds. You can look closely for amazing details, like these small dots of flowers that are woven over only two warp threads. They add interest and help avoid long floats. The fruit is pretty, with bunches of perfect round grapes and a wonderful pineapple with different colored scales, just like the mermaid bodies. These peony panels hang at the Stavanger Art Museum. They have such beautiful abstracted and simple shapes, and there's lovely variation in the warp yarns that are exposed. And they look quite delicate. Textiles often suffer the ravages of time. It's sad to think that some of Frida Hansen's work is lost to us and exciting when weavings are discovered. Because the transparencies were so often used as curtains, many have probably disintegrated entirely or are at least quite faded, like the daisies panels on the left. On the right, you see the bottom fringes of the two tapestry rose panels that I showed earlier. The Stavanger Museum description of the panel states that the fringes were probably exposed to a cat or other pet. The museum chose to leave the chewed up fringes encased in fabric to protect them. Now I'm going to wrap up my talk um, with a final piece. Frida Hansen's last tapestry had a Norwegian theme. It was created to celebrate the 900th anniversary of Christianity in Norway and was originally commissioned by an American museum. However, Frida Hansen wanted to keep it in Norway. It's huge. King Olav kneels in the center, flanked by representatives of the state and church. The Norwegian glacier Fognefonen is in the background. In 1934, the citizens of Stavanger raised money for the tapestry to be hung in the cathedral in Stavanger. She wove this tapestry from 1927 until her death in 1931, and it was completed by her daughter, Elisa Levy, and her daughter-in-law, Signe de Levy. With her last tapestry, she came full circle. She began her career by, try by working to reinvigorate traditional Norwegian weaving. She followed her heart and ever curious nature and wove themes from Greek mythology, mermaids and exotic Egyptian women. In all, she wove 30 large tapestries and designed over 80 transparencies. But in the end, she spent years weaving a, no a noble Norwegian historical image. 
The Art Nouveau style of most of Frida Hansen's work fell out of fashion by the time of her death. It wasn't until a large exhibition of her work in 1973 that she was discovered anew. An important biography was written by Anakin Tua in 1986, and she gained even more attention with the retrospective of her work at the Stavanger Art Museum in 2015. Two books are important if you want to learn more about Frida Hansen. A Beautiful Book with Essays was published by the Stavanger Art Museum in 2015 with text in Norwegian and English. The photos are beautiful, and in case you weren't there, you can see images of the exhibition. It is available in the U.S. through Vesterheim Norwegian American Museum. Anik and Tua published this thorough biography in 1986. However, it is only in Norwegian and out of print. But of course you need to visit the Stavanger Art Museum in Frida Hansen's hometown. They have the largest collection of her works in any museum in their beautifully displayed permanent collection. They also have a virtual tour of the galleries on their website. So thank you for listening today and be sure to sign up for my blog at robbylafleur.com if you want to follow along in my Frida Hansen research. And be sure and let me know if you run across tapestries in her transparency technique, or if you find that large swans and mermaid tapestry sold to a man in California in 1893. Oh, Robbie, thank you, thank you, thank you. This was just fabulous. We have quite a few questions that have come in from folks. Uh, two of them relate to the supplies that Frida Hansen used when she was weaving. Uh, Patrice is asking, what plants did she use for dyeing the wool? You talked about that she got into the natural dyeing early in the early in her career. Um, and Irene was asking, what? Where did she get the yarn? Is it a spe special kind of yarn that was used for her weaving? Um, well, I am, am not an expert dyer, but what I do, and I don't know about the specific plants. I think that research could be done, but um, I do know that she um, she's from Stavanger and in, in that region, region, the Yaren region, that she went out in that first year after she got her loom and she talked to all of the old women in um, in that region of Yaren to find out what the plants were that were used in the old historical tapestries. And I think that's because the commercial dyes became available in the last half of the 1800s. And a lot of those were fading and weren't working well. And so Frida Hansen was gonna go back to the tried and true natural dyes that you know, were still holding in all of those old, uh, in many of the old historical tapestries. And she um, had her yarn spun for her tapestries, um, but I, I don't know really a lot more details about that because one person asked me, you know, did she use spale cell wool um, in her, the spale cell wool that was used in the historical Norwegian tapestries? And there's, I have not seen any evidence that, yes, she did, but she probably used partly spale cell wool and partly other wool. So I, I'm not quite sure. Neat. Great. Uh, you mentioned the fading um, both earlier in the lecture and just now. Have you? Carol was wondering if you have seen other examples of the back to know how much fading has occurred. Um, no, not in a lot of her her tapestries, but um, other than the southward, the one that I was sort of involved when it was rediscovered, and in that one, remarkably, there was like no fading. So it had been cared for well. It had very color fast dyes. And, you know, no matter what, if you hang something in a window for 20 years, it's not going to hold. But right. Right. so no, I haven't seen the back of a lot of other ones. Great. There's a couple questions about her written materials. Are any of her archival materials available? The drawings that she used, notes about the pieces. And then Mawusi is asking if 
there are any written documents with instructions of her transparency technique. Oh, I, I do not know of any documents with written instructions about the technique, for sure. Um, but there are lots of archives and there are lots of um, there are lots of archives and there are many things that Frida Hansen wrote. And, but she wrote about um, sort of the importance of Norwegian historical tapestry and the importance of women weaving and um, lots of sort of more in entrepreneurial um, materials that are available, um, but not so much this is how you do it. Like, wouldn't it be nice if there was an instruction book for the weavers in her studio about, Absolutely. How, about how to weave the tapestries? But to my knowledge, that doesn't exist. And you know, so now I'm trying to figure it all out instead. Um, but there, uh, I did have a really wonderful experience recently because the National Museum in Norway has... Um, well, many things. And so on, I just went on a sort of a preliminary research day on my last trip to Norway in June, and they pulled all the materials and they include many watercolor um, mock-ups for her transparency designs that I had not, I mean, I had not seen. And uh, it was interesting to me that they were uh, small. So the transparencies would be door size and the uh, watercolors were one to 10. So they were only small, like eight, eight by 10 or nine, nine by seven, um, beautiful, exquisite little watercolors. I nearly cried. I mean, I was nearly crying, but it's all. And so on those miniatures, did they have the nuance of the like different colors in the mermaid tails, the different colors in the pineapple? Mm. Well, actually, the ones that I saw were more of for the earlier ones that she was creating, like the mermaid ones were past the time when she had a studio and when she had the weaving studio. And I think she was more involved in, well, but they were done by other people, too. The mermaid ones weren't there. The ones that were um, in the archives tended to be the ones that were done earlier on, the more not the like single image ones, but more the more repetitive design ones. Yeah, great. But they, they still, it's clear from looking at the watercolor designs that when they were made larger and woven that they may have been, they were often done in different color paths or with different colors of yarn. Interesting, interesting, cool. Uh, Patrice is asking if she ever used linen warp in her weaving. No, not that I know of. Oh, um, I think that for her art tapestries, for her fully covered tapestries, I, I believe it's mostly, it's cotton. I haven't okay. seen any, I don't know of any that use a linen warp. Um, and then certainly for her transparencies, the whole point of it was that it was the wool on wool yeah. so that the fuzziness of the wool warp is catching the fuzziness of the wool weft and hope and keeping these images in place and not sliding down. If that makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Sue noted that sun is clearly an enemy of wool tapestry and wondered, are moths or other insects also troublesome? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And when Peter Papp found the found the southward in the plastic container and took it out and examined it. We, one of the first things he wrote and said was, and there's no insect damage, you know, or smoke, you know, which is smoke is also a bad thing if it had been in a, right. I mean, you can especially think of years ago in some smoky salon. You know? So yes, Absolutely. smoke and insects are dangerous. Great. Nan is wondering if you could share again the website of the museum that has the virtual view of the exhibit. Yes, it's the Stavanger Art Museum. So it's um, Stavanger, the name of the town, S-T-A-V as in Victor, A-N-G-E-R, 
Oh, let me let me pull that. I'll just pull the slide up. It's the last. There we go. Perfect. It's, so it's Stavanger Kunstmuseum dot no. And we can leave that slide up for just a minute so folks sure. can oh, yeah. make a note of it or pause at this point in the recording when it gets added to our YouTube channel shortly. Um, the Marguerite daisies feels reminiscent of the repeating florals that some Scandinavian design houses use in their modern textiles. And you talked about Frida Hansen doing both the tapestry weaving and the household textile. Do you know, are there connections from contemporary textile makers to Frida Hansen? Or are they all just growing out of the same, same cultural background and arriving at similar places? I think that phrase you just used uh, arising out of a similar cult cultural background with the you know centuries of geometric designs um, no. seems good but and I don't know I haven't heard personally about any contemporary um, fabric designers who say I was inspired by Frida Hansen but could very well be I, I could it. very well be great and then you mentioned that flowers were her passion and her inspiration for weaving. Uh, someone is asking, what is your passion and inspiration for weaving when it's not looking at a Frida Hansen piece and trying to recreate the technique? Where do you pull inspiration from? Um, well, I, I go to family and history, but this is, if you, I'll s switch this up. If you look at the, this is the, first transparent tapestry that I did. And um, Frida Hansen grew up with exotic birds and flowers and you know, exotic gardens. And I was thinking about what did I grow up with? I did not have exotic gardens, but I had my father's potato farm. So my first transparency was, was a potato. That's amazing. Yeah. Robbie, could you pause the screen share for just a minute so folks oh, can get yes. past the full screen view? see oh pause share okay now did that make it come big there we go there we go now we've got it i've got you spotlighted so folks can see that okay talk a little bit more about this again that's fantastic so so my first my first transparency was I, I I don't have the same background as Frida Hansen, but what is meaningful to me and you know my history and background is meaningful. So this is the the tapestry, the first one that I made, and these the blue part are the open warps. If you see that I part them with the potatoes growing in the ground, and the border on the bottom is uh, our farmers' roses because those are the the kind that were growing wild in the ditches when I was growing up. And it also is quite reminiscent of a Gerhard Munte type of uh, Absolutely. tapestry background. Great. All right. I think we have time for one or two more questions here. Nan is asking if there's any relationship between Hansen and William Morris that you know of. Well, I mentioned in one of the slides that she was definitely um, had very many inter in international influences and she did subscribe to the studio, which was the British magazine um, that wrote a lot about William Morris and the arts and crafts movement. So I would say absolutely she was aware and it was one of her influences. Excellent, excellent. And then Patrice is just sharing a comment in the chat that loving flowers the way she did, she can imagine how crushed she, crushed she was upon losing her beautiful garden when her family's financial situation turned. Are there writings from her at that time talking about, about that? It sounds like a setup because it, 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 actually, it, there, it, it truly is sort of a famous anecdote, which I didn't include in this talk, but um, there was a story about, I mean, it was, awful that they had to sell Hillebog, which had been her childhood home. And then her, the home where she grew up with her children. And um, she said on that day that she took a camellia from her garden and she went in and she pressed it in the leaves of a Bible. And she said, this is the end of my flowers. I, I can't remember exactly what the, what, what the phrase was, but this is the end of my flowers and my gardens but then it wasn't but then it wasn't because she began to weave and 
She became a famous weaver and designer and the flowers bloomed. And lived past her. Yeah. 